Hello, hello, and welcome to a new episode of the BAP podcast. The British Association of Psychopharmacology are celebrating their 50th anniversary in 2024, and we'll be joining them in Birmingham for their annual summer meeting, which takes place from the 21st to the 24th of July. I'm Andre from The Mental Health, and I'll be covering the event this year with my colleague Flo Martin. Flo will be live tweeting from The Mental Health using the hashtag BAP2024, and I'll be recording short videos with speakers and delegates to share online as part of our coverage. There's lots to look forward to in Birmingham, as this meeting always brings together researchers and clinicians from around the world, covering everything from alcohol to schizophrenia. This episode of the podcast features three people who've been involved with the BAP for many years. Anne Lingford Hughes, Professor of Addiction Biology and Head of the Division of Psychiatry at Imperial College London. Belinda Lennox, Professor of Psychiatry, Head of the University Department of Psychiatry in Oxford. And Bill Deakin, Emeritus Professor at the Division of Neuroscience at Manchester University and also past President of the BAP. Along with Alan Young, this group of incredibly knowledgeable and experienced academic clinicians have been invited to run the closing session of the conference this year, entitled The Past and Future of the BAP. I started by asking all of them what role the BAP has played in their career. Here's Belinda Lennox kicking things off. I've been a psychiatrist for 30 years and BAP has always been, in my mind, sort of premier meeting each year for getting really top class clinical and preclinical researchers. And actually, psychopharmacology researchers, I'm not just saying this because of the present company, but obviously they're part of it, have really been the sort of premier thinkers and academics advancing our understanding about the causes and treatments of mental illnesses. So it it was the place to go if you wanted to see the cutting edge science and really get excited about research. I I think it's exactly the same for me. I mean, I I, I can't remember when I first went to a BAP meeting. It was very early on. And so it's a great amalgam of people in industry. That was a, a great pleasure to see, you know, how they worked in addition to the academic psychiatrists, the clinical psychiatrists, and then the university sort of preclinical researchers. So I, my PhD actually was all about rat behaviour, although I, you know, I'm a clinician, I'm a psychiatrist by background, and chose to do psychiatry. I was very interested in rat serotonin and all that sort of stuff. So there was loads and loads of uh, preclinical departments doing that. And of course, there still are. I mean, it's amazing what, what rat psychopharmacology tells us now and the techniques they've evolved for, you know, activating discrete parts of the brain we used to activate the brain with little wire electrodes but now you do it by shining lights and you know, doing stuff like that to activate very specific uh, regions of the brain so i often tell my students that i wouldn't have had my career without bp and I, I genuinely think that really so i did my phd preclinical and moved into clinical so bap was one of the few places you had that translational element and maybe at the time you know, it was it was just what happened, and that was I was comfortable with it. But actually, I think it's become more and more important that clinicians are exposed to preclinical scientists and basic scientists, and vice versa. I probably been there for a member for over thirty years. My mentor at that stage was Rob Kerwin, who again, sadly, is not with us any longer. And Rob said, "You have to go to BAP. You know, this is where it's at." And, and I went to BAP a meeting in Cambridge and presenting my poster around alcoholism and David not happened to be there got his MLC grant and through that meeting you know I think that's the other thing that BAP gives you is that network and connectivity which has been so vital I think aside from the research the other bit that's been quite important to me so I was general secretary many moons ago and and part of that in those days was education and training and Bill then asked me to join the certificate in addiction which all 25 plus years later I'm still doing with Julia Sinclair and and that's been the I think the educational stuff we do we started the master classes those have been phenomenally successful so I think the other thing about being part of BAP what did given me but it also has been about what we've the organization has been able to do and set up and really get the psychopharm message very clear clearly across I think and and that's been really really important and the other thing I'd say about the addiction you know we've been through tough times that wondered whether we would have a future as a certificate but we, we just had one last month or earlier this month in Manchester and it was vibrant one of the f- biggest audiences we've had and so 
you know, that's the other aspect, I think, to BAP has been amazing, you know, that we, we're part of this big family, really. And that's great. Yes, the family aspect of it is yes. important. You feel you're part of a, a huge family. <laughs> I think and if you trace everybody back, you could probably go back to the founding yeah. and they were mostly fathers. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we're all connected in some way. Yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah. And the timing of the meeting. So everybody times their summer holidays around BAP yeah. and then they go off for the summer. So it is like a... Mm, that's yeah. true. Yeah. 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 And so the nice thing about the certificate was that, uh, or it is, I mean... It, it, it's mixing with uh, pe you know, people who are not academic, but want to find more out more about psychopharmacology. So, you know, I've been doing the schizophrenia one but for donkey's years. I stopped recently. But uh, just, just meeting regular trainee psychiatrists who, who are not going to be academic, feeding th the science stuff through to them and their interests is, is, is always very stimulating and a pleasant, gregarious, warm meeting. Yeah, and I just think that's the other important role. And I think... I've really valued being part of that, delivering it as well, because every time you learn something, you know, and the network is amazing and you can see the light bulb moment and somebody thinks, ah, you've given me a different idea about how I could manage that challenging clinical situation or, mm. you know, so much of what we do is rooted in psychopharm. And I, I was always taught by Rob that, you know, it, it's rational prescribing of medication. So sometimes we're telling people to stop or withdraw or change. It's not all about more and more drugs, more and more medication. It's about being clear why you're prescribing. And I think, you know, that's been a valuable part of the, the BAP. Yeah, I think that's right. I think they really do have an authority around mm. psychopharmacology. So it's not just sort of communication with um, clinicians and training clinicians. It's much broader than that as well. It's about public communication about the value of, of these medications. So we, I mean, because I'm the vice chair of the psychopharmacology committee in the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and we we often, well, all of our consensus some um, guidelines, for instance, with jointly with BAP around antidepressants or around antipsychotics, whatever it might be, and that's really important. Yeah, the guidelines actually are phenomenal, and um, being involved in several of them, and as you say, they're they're seen as gold standard in many cases. So apart from all the academic stuff that we may get, I think it's the other bit about how we can more broadly improve prescribing and practice. Maybe you could each tell me about a really key classic psychopharmacology paper that's been published in the last 50 years uh, that's really made a difference at the front line. Learning about the discovery of monoamines and their localization in the brain, I'm, you know, I'm going way back now to the 60s. But that, that era had just, just got consolidated when I joined. And so the papers of Arvid Carlson and Scandinavian people, the studies that show that amphetamine abusers could develop a paranoid psychosis that the psychiatrists couldn't tell the difference between that and the, you know, the, the real things that were. And particularly Carlson's, Carlson's Nobel Prize winning idea that not only is dopamine a neurotransmitter, but antipsychotic drugs probably work on that system. One of the classic papers was that antipsychotic drugs increase the turnover of dopamine. So, you know, what does that mean? And this clever idea was, well, it's the receptors that have been overstimulated and they're being blocked uh, by the antipsychotics. And so you see this increase in dopamine turnover in the brain, inferring that there must be dopamine receptors in the brain and that they're getting overstimulated in people with schizophrenia. So that, that was awesome stuff. And being able to visualize those neurons in the rat brain and the human brain using these sort of fluorescence technique, these the neurons sort of glow out in their pathways and suggest all sorts of ideas about how they might work. So that was the beginning for me, the Carlson papers, really. When I started training in the early 90s, we were routinely prescribing two gram equivalent of chlorpromazine. And then PEPs, I was part of Rob Cohen, Lynn Pulaski's group for a while. And, um, you know, a lot, a lot of the PET studies, Faraday, Kapoor showing occupancy of antipsychotics and you know now the very famous graph really showing that you know above a certain occupancy you've got no extra efficacy but lots of side effects and we knew what dose of each of the antipsychotics we achieved so that to me that within a within a post really that transformed how much we were prescribing because we knew there was no point so I think I've always seen the power of that kind of research 
to transform clinical and it didn't take years and years it it really for my mind you know I heard about it at a meeting and it pretty much quick you know happened quite quickly really maybe I'm looking through rose tinted glasses I think in, in my field I can't think of one paper that would stand out like that but addiction neurobiology has grown from having to be addiction is a brain disease Alan Leshner editorial in science to now we actually have quite well characterized neurocircuitry and neurobiology and we have new targets so there's been a huge body work I think we're shifting away from just thinking about reward and dopamine to the stress systems and amygdala and the, the frontal cortex and all these different new targets so for me that's been the biggest shift in the field and I think it, the the antipsychotic D2 receptor occupancy shows how powerful once you understand biology and we've had several drugs in addiction that have come from understanding the biology into the clinic. I was just really struck by a conversation I had with Phil Cowan who's a sort of wonderful guru of psychopharmacology who just said he can't think of a single medicine that we use in psychiatry that wasn't discovered by serendipity. There wasn't there wasn't a single one he can think of that went through the sort of drug development pipeline mm. of basic research of receptor profiles or whatever, and a sort of principled scientific idea that was then trialed out on healthy individuals and patients and so forth. It's always gone back the other way. It's always been clinical observation of a sort of surprising kind and then going backwards and then working out what the psychopharmacology underlying it, you know, that might be mechanistically important for those disorders. As you know, my research is around autoimmunity and inflammation is wondering actually whether we've been getting the wrong end of the stick all along and maybe we should be challenging ourselves a bit more. Psychiatrists are very open-minded, but maybe we should be just trying to think through whether this sort of backwards theorizing and mechanistic assumptions might be missing a different dimension that we weren't even looking at. So I, that doesn't really help you, but um, I don't know, that's what I'm thinking about at the moment. Yeah, no, that is really interesting, isn't it? I suppose it leads us on quite nicely to looking forwards. We've done a little bit of looking backwards in this conversation so far, and your session at the conference in Birmingham is going to be looking backwards over the last 50 years of BAP and then thinking into the future, what what would you say are some of our kind of best bet areas that we need to be focusing on for this field to be really taking leaps and bounds forwards? What well, I'm really excited about at the moment are, it, is different ways of doing clinical trials. Instead of being hugely expensive you know, many years testing out one particular drug and assembling a huge infrastructure to getting an answer of many, many millions of pounds that, you know, and this has been essentially pretty disappointing over many decades. There are different ways of doing these trials and multi-arm, multi-stage platform trials that have been hugely successful in other areas such as cancer, and are now being rolled out in other degenerative diseases. But I think this is the huge potential for us. So much quicker, clever statistical models that you get early signals of testing completely different compounds that test different mechanisms of action. And if you get one compound that shows no signal of action whatsoever, you discard the whole class of, <laughs> of medicines, basically, and you, you, you just move on. You know, so you get a much quicker readout of, of things that might be interesting. And you, you pick compounds to test that really address completely different lines of, of action. So you might get surprising results that you hadn't even thought of. That's what I'm quite excited about. You can come back in 20 years time and see whether I was completely wrong. COVID has been a great example, hasn't it, for doing those sorts of trials, but they have such a definitive endpoint. One problem with uh, psychosis is what, you know, what, what is a sort of consistent, hard endpoint that we could use? And maybe it comes down to these sort of personalised ways of measuring symptoms on your mobile phone and AI takes care of uh, analysing to give you the uh, endpoint. Yeah, it's such a key point. It's got to be a meaningful endpoint as well, because we course, only yeah. measure things that are easy to measure. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually important for people with the disorder. I think improving infrastructure or methodology is really, really key. I do feel some hope in our field. So the Office of Life Sciences has funded an addiction mission of which I'm chair, but also the um, mental health mission led by Husseini Manji and Catherine Abel. And altogether about 75 million vested. And this is 
to improve the research ecosystem and structure. So in addiction, we're trying to improve knowledge. We're trying to improve the regulatory side because of where addiction services sit in the UK, in England, they're in the third sector. We're trying to improve the number of people. We're trying to retain people. Um, I know in the mental health mission, they're working also on how to do clinical trials and make it more efficient and all this kind of stuff. So there's a lot of activity going on. So if I'm going forward, I would say, if I look back a little bit, there's been a bit of a lull maybe, but it's been recognized that this is a very important part of what the UK can do and therefore we need to support and fund it appropriately so I do look forward with hope more hope than I may have done a few years ago with this investment and and not only the scrutiny and the focus on it that this is key part of what we need to be doing in terms of improving outcomes for mental health in the UK and obviously contribute globally I think it's also about the integration so what was interesting if you looked back to the horizon scanning 20 plus years ago about where we would be now digital stuff really doesn't get a mention very much. And I think that's exploded, whether it's wearables and monitoring or through all the way to using AI, machine learning, whatever to analyze data, that will take off. And I think the whole bit about who has access to what of my data and how to share and what to share, I think that's going to be really interesting to see how that evolves. Because I'm very struck when I listen to people talking about you can have a virtual meeting or you can just fill in everything from this app. I think about my mum, who's 90, and I think about my typical client in my addiction service. And I think, could both of those access that help? Usually the answer is no. So we are at risk of increasing health inequalities, potentially, if we don't think how we're going to integrate this. And you may think, what's this got to do with BAP and psychopharm? Well, of course, how med- people are responding to medications, adherence, through to side effects, through to are they getting benefit? What are the outcome measures? All of this, we will be using all of this technology to improve how we deliver trials and outcomes and we gain opinions really, how they're gonna combine and then how you combine with psychological approaches, psychotherapy and all that kind of stuff. I think that's gonna be really interesting to see how that plays out over the next 20, 25 years. I guess over the last sort of 30 years or so, we have seen a changing public view towards psychopharmacology. And frontline treatments are now much more, you know, there's a lot more choice for people. And obviously digital really adds to that in terms of scalability and particularly global mental health. Do you think psychopharmacology is always going to be front and centre in mental health treatment? How do you see BAP as part of that? I know there are certain very senior people I can remember in the past advocating that we should be neurobiologists or biologists rather than focusing on pharmacology. It was a bit reductionist. And I guess it it depends. For me, you know, a warm, fuzzy feeling that somebody might explain in psychological terms, I'm thinking, well, is that endorphins? Is that oxytocin? You know, I probably think down to neurochemistry because I would argue, I can't imagine an emotion without some movement of neurotransmitters in the brain, quite frankly, or modulators or something like that. Rational prescribing is really important and understanding the role that the medication plays in the holistic. One of the reasons I loved psychiatry was it wasn't just about psychopharm, particularly in addiction, there is a social aspect, there is a mental health aspect, there's a physical health aspect. It's part of the landscape. And I think we all know that Whilst drugs are extremely powerful and are often the only thing or the really the necessary thing in that moment, we're talking about outcomes. You know, you you generally going to need a psychological approach or some psychosocial support or their environment needs to be supported or changed. You know, there's all the other bits as well. It's part of the landscape. So I can't see how you can put psychopharmacology out of the out of the picture. I think it will always have a role. I'm in no way a biological reductionist and I'm very comfortable in my clinical practice and as an academic recognising the importance of all different contributions. But I do feel that psychopharmacology is central to psychiatry. We've just completed a a network meta-analysis of all the components of early psychosis care and what is the vital contributions to a good outcome. And you know, each bit, each part, whether that's psychological therapy or family therapy or care coordination, 
all add value to some outcomes, but they're all completely overshadowed by the huge contribution and importance of medication underpinning all that. So that they're additional components and they're very important for quality of life, but not in comparison to having an antipsychotic alongside that. Yes, it depends on the severity of the, the disorder. Psychopharmacology probably is frontal central for severe uh, mental illness. But you know, what, what are the limits of psychiatry, I suppose it is? I mean, you know, for mood disorders and stress reactions and all that sort of thing, I wouldn't say that drugs are you know, front and centre in, in treatment. And I don't, I don't think I can think of a psychiatrist who is opposed to the idea that uh, you know, clinical psychology, social workers and you know, the, what used to be the multidisciplinary team don't have a key role in managing you know, every level of severity. It's just that some disorders like schizophrenia, you know, severe psychosis if it's chronic and enduring, psychopharmacology is uh, absolutely key. Why should people stick around to the end of this conference? Because you're literally the last session. <laughs> Can you give me a kind of a, an advert for this session? Why should people bother to hang around and join for this? You'll get to hear all of the top secrets from Professors Young, Deakin and Lingford Hughes that they have never revealed to anyone before. <laughs> it's going to be a massive gossip festival. <laughs> yes, I think there'll there'll be a fair bit of anecdotal stuff, I should imagine, and uh, yeah. personal experiences. I think that's uh, people find that interesting. Being invited to do it, you know, is great also because it is very rarely in our busy lives that do we stop and reflect and actually mm -hmm. think backwards and forwards. And actually, as I said, finding the documents for where would we be in twenty twenty five and looking at that and seeing how we predicted and what has changed and not that see what the future might look like and then we can our successors well i'm not sure i'll be here in 20 25 years doing this maybe i will be it's always good to predict and then see what happens really big thanks to Anne, belinda and bill for taking the time to speak with me for the bap podcast i highly recommend sticking around until the end of the summer meeting in birmingham and not missing what promises to be a really excellent final session all about the past and the future of the BAP. That's it for now. This is Andre signing off. I'll see you in the next episode of the BAP podcast coming soon.